Good afternoon. I'll call the uh, subcommittee back to order, and uh, we'll recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mack, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, before I before I begin, I want to congratulate you for uh, being the chair of this uh, subcommittee and uh, for being here in Washington. Thank you. For people who don't know, we served in the uh, legislature together in yes. Florida, and I and he's a great friend. And uh, the committee's lucky to have you, thank you. Uh, as chair. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, and before I begin, I. Before we left, we were, something kind of struck me, and, and we, we keep asking, well, how can we kind of help get the Postal Service in the right direction? And, and, and part of me is uh, thinking, well, government just doesn't know how to run a business. I mean, so first of all, the idea that the government is going to fix a business model, I think, has been proven over and over and over again. They can't do it. I mean, so I think what we're really talking about here is time. I mean, t at some point, some drastic changes are going to have to be made to the Postal Service. I mean, uh, if you're in front of, if this committee is going to, and, and no disrespect to anybody on this committee, but the idea that somehow government is going to fix this, um, I'm not sure that government has a great track record when it comes to business. So I just thought I'd put that out there. Um, the Office of the Inspector General recently released a study in which it looked at shifting costs from ratepayers to taxpayers. Um, and, you know, this, I think the study was pretty clear about uh, that that may be a way that it has to go to be solvent. Um, are you ready, uh, Mr. Donahue, are you ready to admit that the only way to stay afloat is through a bailout by the taxpayers? Thank you, Congressman. I, uh First of all, I, I think I take umbrage with the fact that we can, can't get our, uh, get our finances together and uh, right the ship in the Postal Service. Um, we, as a government entity uh, providing universal service to the American public, have done a pretty good job, especially over the last 10 years, from a standpoint of, of cost improvement, service improvement. And granted, we have got some uh, constraints around some of the revenue generation that, we've, that, uh, that we see, but uh, we also think we have got a good plan going forward. And with a little freedom and flexibility, we think we can get there. Uh, the major issue that we have got, again, is the, uh, is the issue with the prepayment of the retiree health benefits. And I, I, think, I understand. Yeah, and I think there is a result, there is an opportunity to resolve that. Now, I have to ask you a question. On your statement, is that from our IG or is that from a different IG? I am not 100 percent sure. This is, it's, a, it's a recent release study is from the, the Office of Inspector General. That is probably the OPM. That is the, the OPM's IG. I okay, think. okay, you are right. Yeah, okay. Here, but here's, but here's, let me just ask you this. Okay. Okay. Yep. Forget about the study. Okay. I mean, you have already admitted that there's big problems right yes, now. Yes, absolutely. So are you prepared to admit that uh, you are going to need a bailout to stay afloat? We will not need a bailout. Here, here's the way we look at this. There is a couple solutions. Number one, we have an overpayment into the retiree health benefit or to, into the retirement systems, whether it is civil service or Okay, okay. Or I'm, I only have a few minutes. So, okay. so the answer is you think no. I think no. Um, are there any uh, modifications to a, a postal employee's pay or benefit schedule that would help insolvency? Absolutely. We are working with our unions right now. We have got uh, union contracts uh, discussion going on with the American Postal Workers Union, rural carriers. Uh, we are having some very good discussions about flexibility. And what, what, are they, what are they offering right now? We are talking about changes in flexibility and compensation going forward. Now, are they, are, is there talk about coming down to the rest of the Federal workforce, the, the pay schedule and, uh, and benefits? The only pay that, that the Postal Service has that is in excess of the rest of the Federal Government is in terms of the health care contribution. It is a very small portion of what we pay our people. We are, through, through negotiations, working to come to the same <laughs> level. That is minimal. The big opportunities are working. Do you, do you think that can be achieved? Do you think the unions will agree to Absolutely. come to the rest of the Federal workforce? The, the unions are already coming to that level. We've got, we've, we've seen so the, progress in the last contract. There have been, there each, we've moved one percent per year in the last contract, and what's being discussed right now will get us to that level in the next four years. In the next four years. Yes. So of the rest of the uh, federal workforce. 
That is a small portion. The pay portion. And, and the benefit. No, 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 no. That is the small portion. That is that's the compensation uh, that we uh, give our people in terms of health benefit contribution. Our people pay right now uh, about 81 percent towards their, we pay 81 percent towards their health benefits. I have got, I've got 25 seconds, okay. so let me just uh, right. ask, ask one more question. Okay. Uh, do you believe the, the, uh, the United States Postal Service is too big to fail? We are too big to fail. We are an important part of the American economy, an important part of American society. We will deliver 171 billion pieces of mail this year. We and you are going to do that without a bailout? We are not going to have a bailout. There is a solution to this. There is a number of things that we can do working with Congress to get a resolution, and it is not a bailout. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Uh, now I now recognize the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Mrs. Norton, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, I want to thank you uh, again. Uh, Mr. Postmaster, for, for the improvements in delivery that you personally made in this region some years ago. Uh, so we see, I, I love that. You did something good then, and look where you are now. Thank you, ma'am. I'd, like I'd like to know where we are headed. We have been talking about the, the Postal Service model for some time, yet we have seen no, no alteration in the model. And many of us, I think on both sides, no, can't, believe, can't believe that this model is meant for, 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 for all time. Uh, if you look at the assumptions of the statute, uh, when we, the United States uh, Congress set up the Postal Service, uh, essentially it was that you would be a profit-making business. Is that not true? At least to break even. So a profitable business at least. Yes, ma'am. Uh, on page one of your testimony, you say our core business will always be delivery. There is one customer need that will not change, and it is the very essence of what we do day in and day out. Uh, now, I, 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 I must ask you, um, if we make the kinds of assumptions that we are making at this hearing, that uh, perhaps you will pay but not overpay. In, into the trust fund, and you calculated that to be 55 or 75 million, take, give or take how many millions you want to. Let's say you pay or, or not overpay. Um, let's assume that you are delivering mail five days a week. Um, can you say to us this afternoon that this model, which regards, which which requires you to make, be a profitable enterprise, delivering the mail as you are delivering it now, uh, is a uh, model. The model in the statute is a model. The model of a profitable enterprise is a model we can expect to survive. That you will be a profitable enterprise under the assumptions of the statute that you are now held to now. And remember, I am saying you, you would not overpay into the trust fund. Yes, ma'am. I think that we can be profitable. I think that there are a number of things that have to happen. Number one, the Postal Service has undertaken a number of issues, revenue generation, cost reductions on our own, that we feel responsible towards and will work towards that point. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are also working with the unions going forward. We have got very responsible leadership there. They understand what we have to do for a strong postal service. So we will take care of what we need to take care of. The key for us is this. We are being required to prepay a health benefit rate $5.5 billion. This year we will lose $6.4 billion. So, and that is why I said if, we're, if we assume that that is no longer a problem, yes. then we will be back to a profitable enterprise. Uh, under the assumptions of the statute in 1970 or whenever this it was. Year, this year, if we were not required to make that payment, we would break even. And that is with a volume loss of. But you were required not to overpay. Right. And that is and that's with a volume loss of 22 percent. So our people have done a great job taking substantial right. costs. That is very important to note. If it, you say that, but for this overpayment, and no, normally if you overpay something, you do a refund. So I am hearing you. I would like to ask uh, one more question, and, and, and I, I, want, I don't want false hopes here, um, but I, I noted on page two of your, uh, of your testimony that something I have not heard before in a very long time, I don't think I heard it before, period. The first quarter showed a modest increase of 1.5 percent. 
I mean, it's not because people could get their tax forms. I mean, to what do you attribute an increase? You say you lost in your testimony. You say that the Christmas season was not very good. Uh, why, 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 is it, why, is, why is this first quarter showing a modest increase You're, in first class mail? Well, the increase is total volume, and we have seen a 9.6 percent increase in standard mail, advertising mail, an increase in our package business, but we have had a decrease of 5.9 percent in first, cla uh, first class. First class pays the freight, and that is why we have been asking also for the consideration before Congress to go from six to five days. And you think that then would? I have what effect? I will tell you this. If we can get a resolution around the health benefits, if we can get a resolution around the first payment, the President has made that recommendation in his budget, and we can get a resolution around the 6 to 5 day, these are things that are not in our control. I know that we can get this organization profitable and strong going into the future. We are marking that down, Mr. Postmaster. Yes, ma'am, you can. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I uh, would now like to recognize the gentleman from Michigan and our subcommittee, Vice Chairman, Mr. Amash, for five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the panel for being here. And uh, Mr. Donahoe, I really enjoyed meeting you the other day and, and chatting with you. Thank you. Uh, you had uh, just said, I think, that you guys would uh, break even if you didn't have to make the, the pre-funding. This year, yes. But um, I think your own plan shows that you would op have an operating income loss. Our, our plan shows an operating income loss of about $900 million, but we will continue to cut. We have got a, a plan in, in place right now. We are addressing administrative co uh, cost reduction, $750 million. We will get some of that this year. We have got some other changes going. Our, our goal would be to, to make $100 million this year if we were able to be uh, forgiven from the uh, prepayment plan this year. Okay. I have a, a I have a copy of the letter from the uh, Office of Personnel Management to former Postmaster General John Potter. Uh, it is from September 2004, and it rejects the claim that USPS has overpaid the civil service system, um, civil service retirement system. OPM explains that the Postal Service's request for a return of $75 billion in overpayment to the CSRS is unfounded and should not be granted by the Congress. Furthermore, the letter includes a statement from the CSRS Board of Actuaries in which it declares that OPM has appropriately and accurately determined the financial obligations for the Postal Service. Uh, Mr. Chair, I ask unanimous consent to submit this letter for the record. And, Mr. Donahoe, what is your response to the letter? Here is my response. We have uh, differing opinions here. Our IG and the Postal Service has estimated with external actuaries that we have overpaid $75 billion. Uh, the Postal Regulatory Commission has looked at the same information, and their outside actuaries have estimated that we have overpaid somewhere between 50 and 55. So there is a meeting of the minds necessary to sit down and get this resolved once and for all. So you, you do disagree with the letter, though? I disagree with the letter. If, okay. if I, I could add that the PAEA actually has a provision so that the Postal Service can ask us to review the OPM analysis. And the Postal Regulatory Commission uh, did what we believe is an objective analysis, bringing in a highly respected third party uh, expert to review the situation. So one could say you have the self interest of the Postal Service and the self interest of the Office of Personnel Management, each one wanting to protect its funds. But I, I want to assure you that the Postal Regulatory Commission had no preconceptions, gave this uh, uh, study no pr prior directions, and we came up with what we believe is a fair and objective assessment that there is, in fact, a $50 billion overpayment there. And without objection, uh, the, the letter so referenced is uh, entered in the record. I, I have a, a question for Mr. Herr as well. Uh, in your testimony, uh, you recognize that a a significant financial issue for uh, the Postal Service is the fact that 80 percent of its costs go toward employee salaries and benefits. Do you believe uh, that U USPS should be able to renegotiate uh, collective bargaining agreements? Uh, one, I, one area that we uh, suggested that Congress reconsider is whether uh, contracts that go to binding arbitration, if there is an impasse, that uh, there be a consideration given to the Postal Service's ability to pay and given its financial situation. So that is an area that we have highlighted in prior work, and I highlighted, highlighted again today in my statement. And the, uh, the President has suggested giving USPS some breathing room. Um, will, will that actually make the problem worse by delaying it? 
Uh, I would say that uh, one of the things we have been on the record is saying that the Postal Service needed some short-term relief for this retiree health care uh, benefit uh, payment. We have been saying that for two years. This would be a third year. I think this is really the time we are at the statutory debt limit to make some hard decisions about what this organization is going to look like going forward. Um, your the overall liabilities and obligations outlined in my statement are over $100 billion now. So it is time to take into consideration the changing use of the mail, what kind of footprint the Postal Service needs, and then how, and really think about how that is all going to be paid for, including retiree benefits, which employees are expecting to. Thank you all for your testimony. I, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The distinguished gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and again, uh, congratulations on your elevation as chairman of the subcommittee. Uh, and I thank my good friend and colleague, Mr. Lynch, for his leadership in the past on these issues and some very thoughtful and groundbreaking hearings we have had in the past, this being uh, another contribution. And welcome to the panelists. Uh, Mr. Hare, let's start with that last point. Um, the issue of whether the President bought some breathing room um, I believe in his budget he recommended, was it $4 billion of relief? That is my understanding, yes, sir. And that $4 billion, is, is it not predicated on the same assumption Ms. Goldway makes and, for that matter, the Postmaster General makes, that, in fact, there have been overpayments? Uh, I think that is actually predicated on the fact that there would be other uh, efforts underway to restructure as right. well. This, is, this would be a deferment. It is not a uh, it, it, my understanding of the proposal the President made. I, I understand that, Mr. Hare, but is it not by implication a recognition that, in fact, this is an issue, that there have been overpayments in the past? Is it a uh, I guess you would have to, I would have to look at the fine print. I All right. That. Well, certainly the President, hopefully in his budget, wasn't trying to add to the postma uh, Postmaster's woes fiscally. He wasn't trying to add to that debt. Uh, well, it was it's a He was trying to provide relief. Right. It is a short-term relief. Do, do you, does the GAO have an opinion about this issue of whether there is 50 to $75 billion of overpayments? We have not looked at You have not looked at it. I, have, I can assure you we have read the reports. You would agree, however, that if anywhere between 50 and $75 billion were verified, that that alone, amortized over some period of time, could provide significant relief to what is currently uh, a significant imbalance in the operational revenues of the post, Postal Service? Given the numbers that are being discussed, yes, that would be a significant You would agree. Money. Okay. As the GAO, do you have any plans to look at this? Uh, if requested by Congress, we would certainly, and both today, both the, my well, colleagues. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I would hope that this subcommittee would, in fact, make such a request. That is not a trivial number. I and if we are going to talk about dire futures for the Postal Service, surely we want to look into a $50 to $75 billion item that could provide relief fairly quickly over an amortized basis. And I know, Mr. Chairman, you share my concern about the options in front of us, and I would urge the subcommittee to consider making a formal request to GAO for just such a study. Um, uh, let me ask another question, Mr. Hare, and maybe Ms. Goway or uh, Mr. Postmaster General Donahoe, you as well. Between 1990 and 2007, did overall mail volume for the Postal Service go up or down? Between 1990 went up. and 2007, it went, up. it went up at precisely the time the internet was coming in full play in the United States. Is that correct? Yes. So the relationship between the internet and mail volume is not necessarily always inevitably a negative one. Might one conclude that, given that statistic, Ms. Goldway? Oh, I, I think uh, my theory is that human beings have an insatiable appetite for communication and everything will grow. Right. But, but it grows in different stages, just like radio is adjusting. My time is limited, so, but oh, I'm, I'm, uh, that's but all right. It, but but I, do, I do think it that went up. I, it went up, and I think. Did it go but, up last year? Uh, did mail, did mail volume go up or down last year? Mail volume went down. It went down over yes. the previous year? Yes, slightly. Slightly. Um, when we look at, because you talked a little bit, I think you may reference, uh, Mr. Donahoe, to uh, uh, the impact of the Internet on your, your business. Uh, but the Internet can also generate business, can it not? For example, if I order a book from Amazon, right. not only is that business for the Postal Service, but it is actually lucrative business for the Postal Service. Is that not correct? Absolutely. Um, Ms. Goldway, um, because my time is limited, have you had a chance to look at the draft legislation we have been working on 
And do you, by and large, find that it is uh, consistent with many of the findings the Postal Regulatory Commission has brought before this subcommittee over the years? Uh, I certainly think that, m that many of the suggestions that have been discussed in, in, uh, by other legislators to address the financial issues are included, and I am very pleased. And then, in addition, there are some specific items that you and I have addressed that we think will uh, really improve the revenues for the Postal Service in the future and uh, position it as a more modern uh, agency with the rest of the government. So I, I certainly appreciate your efforts there. And I am sure it will be a valuable contribution to the conversations for legislation. We can only hope, and I am going to run out of time. I have 20 seconds, but real quickly, um, don't we have a problem on top of everything else with the aging and costly vehicular fleet of the Postal Service? I will take that one. Yes, we do. We, uh, we have a fleet of 185,000 delivery vehicles that are about 22 years old on average. Mr. Chairman, I have run out of time, but if I had a lot of time, we would talk about this issue because I think it is an, another burden that they have got to face. Thank you very much. Thank you. And just for the record, as part of that conversation, we did invite uh, the Office of Management and Budget to attend here that I think could have addressed some of these questions. Uh, they declined the invitation, but I think it would have been healthy to have them here as well. Uh, now I would like to recognize the distinguished gentleman from Illinois, uh, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and um, let me congratulate you on your elevation. As a matter of fact, we had a young fellow here yesterday testifying, and he mentioned the colleges that he wanted to attend, and he railed off about 10, and all of them were in Florida. So there must be something, something good well, about Florida. Well, as an Auburn graduate, I, you know, I take some, some difference with that. <laughs> Let me, let me welcome the witnesses, and uh, it is a pleasure to see you and to have you here with us, Mr. Donahue, uh, Ms. Goldway, Mr. Herr. It is good to see you again. Um, you know, I have listened to the testimony and I have listened to the questioning, and of course I am not one of these individuals who believe that government cannot get it right. I, I, I don't subscribe to that school of thought. I think that government can, in fact, get it right. And I guess as one of the persons who helped put together the Postal Enhancement and Accountability Act, we thought <laughs> we were getting it right or at least moving in the direction of getting it right. We, we, we thought that we were providing the kind of flexibilities that the Postal Service needed. We thought we were providing opportunities for new products and new approaches, and we thought we were providing opportunity to make use of all the resources that the Postal Service should have at its disposal. You attempted a moment ago to talk about your vision in terms of how we can get it right and how we can have the Postal Service be self-sufficient, how we can make sure that we interact a certain way with our stakeholders and, and our unions. Could you share uh, uh, that direction for us again? Sure. Thank you very much. I, uh, I do believe the Postal Service is, is, is and will be a very viable part of the American economy and American society. There is definitely changes going on, but we do provide uh, that kind of contact that people are looking for. Uh, if you look at what we offer from a standpoint of the ability for a business to get in front of a customer's eyes, we are the most direct way, the most direct. And there is plenty of opportunity there. You know, you talk about the Internet, there is oftentimes no way you will find a website unless you get a postcard in the mail that says, come to my website. And we know we provide value there. We know we provide value for small business in the, in the package shipping business. When they can go down to a local post office and put three or four or five packages in at a flat rate if it fits the ships with guaranteed delivery within two to three days, there is tremendous value there. And we know that people will continue to mail packages. We know we have got some very valuable uh, partnerships. UPS and FedEx, we deliver the last mile for a lot of their packages. This holiday season, we delivered 16 percent more than we did last year. So we know there is definitely opportunity in that area. Um, we, we also realize that there are costs that we need to address. 
I think, as I said before, we have very responsible leadership from our unions. They understand this. They, they can hear the waterfall. They understand that we have to make some changes. We are having very good discussions with the APWU. The rural carriers have kept the contracts open, so we think that there are some, some opportunities to move in the right direction there. With our management associations, we have seen progress in a lot of the changes we have made there. They have been very supportive in big changes that we have had to make within the administrative staff to reduce costs due to the mail volume drop. Congressman, I am, I am 100 percent positive that there is a ton of value in the Postal Service. I think from a government perspective, Postal Service is pretty proud of the fact that we do a good job, excellent service. We have taken more costs out of this organization than any private firm, and we know that we can continue to do that in the future. We need the aid of Congress on a couple issues. Let me just ask you, I know that we have been talking about loss projections and we hear the $900 million. Have we ever had any projections that were higher than that? Higher in terms of losses? Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and so that means that we are actually well, if we making get a, some progress. Sure. There. If we can get some resolution on a couple of these fixed costs, we definitely can. And the other thing that is important is there is, with the uncertainty of all of this discussion about year after year the Postal Service loses money, that starts to make customers fearful of doing business with us. We need to get that behind us. We are the linchpin of a $1 trillion industry. That needs to be resolved. Well, I was always told that wherever there was a wheel, there was a way. That's it right. seems to me that you have got both the wheel and you are searching for the way, and I think you are refreshing, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, at this time, I want to thank our panel for taking the time uh, and now take just a brief recess while we get ready for our second panel. We are probably going to have another vote series uh, a little bit after 4, so hopefully we can accomplish all we need to accomplish before that vote series. And again, thank you all for being here. And thank you. We will let the clerk set up for the next panel. Everybody ready? We will uh, call the, meet, the subcommittee back to order. Uh, and now we will recognize our second panel. Uh, Mr. Sampi is seated to my left is the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Valpac. Mr. Sackler is the Coordinator of the Coalition for 21st Century Postal Service. And Mr. Frederick Berlando is the President of the National Association of Letter Carriers. Uh, gentlemen, I will um, uh, ask you to stand to be sworn in. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, please be seated. 
Uh, again, in order to allow time for discussion and questions, please limit your testimony to five minutes. Of course, your uh, written testimony has been submitted and entered into the record. And with that, I will start with Mr. Sampy. You are recognized. Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Jim Sampy. I am the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Cox Target Media, headquartered in Largo, Florida. We own Valpac Direct Marketing Systems and we are one of the largest direct mail firms in North America. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on what we agree is a looming crisis for the USPS. Valpac has been in the business for over 42 years. We pioneered the concept of local co cooperative direct mail in the United States. Valpac is owned by Cox Enterprises, based in Atlanta, which is one of the largest media conglomerates in the United States. Valpac is a franchise organization with, nearly, with locations in every state. Valpac represents more than 2,000 direct and franchised employees. Each year, we assist more than 54,000 small businesses from mom and, local mom and pops to large national companies. Today, Valpac delivers savings and values to about 40 million households each month. And each year, our familiar blue envelope carries some 20 billion money-saving offers in 500 million envelopes. Just three years ago, we opened a $220 million facility in St. Petersburg, Florida to accommodate our growth for the future. Our company is also aggressively entering the digital space in the online and mobile couponing business. This will allow us to reach new customers with our products and continue to serve as a leader in our industry. Our digital strategies will continue to complement our mail volume. The nature of our business means that we watch the USPS and its issues very closely. We believe that the Post Office under Jack Potter and now Pat Donahoe have done a remarkable job in downsizing the Post Office to adjust for plummeting mail volumes while maintaining high service levels. If you were to set aside the $5.5 billion artificially financial burden to prepay future retiring health costs, which Congress imposed in the PAEA, the Post Office actually had an operating profit of $601 million over the last four years. We believe the Post Office's March 2, 2010 action plan envisioning America's future postal service was well designed and except for its proposal to reduce the role of the Postal Regulatory Commission, we support it in all respects. It seems to us that the Post Office is constantly getting caught up in the political machinations of Congress. It may not be popular to tell Congress that the bill was ill-conceived, but look at what the PAEA did. It imposed a CPI-based cap on prices. It gave the Post Office virtually no new powers to cut costs. And at the last minute, we were told that it was necessary to get the bill scored properly, Congress needed to impose a $5.5 billion annual financial burden to prepay future retiring health costs, a burden imposed on no other agency or company. Valpac, along, along with all mailers, urges Congress and the Commission to address the financial issue by removing the 5.5 artificial burden, annual burdens on mailers to prefund the postal retirement health benefits and require the Office of Personnel Management to recalculate the CRS, CRS, CSRS and FERS obligations using overpayments made by mailers towards these retirement expenses to help pay ordinary health benefit expenses. On the cost-cutting items, we urge Congress and the Commission to allow the USPS to move to five-day delivery. By recent polls, at least two-thirds of the people don't care that much about Saturday delivery, and it would allow the Post Office to save what should be about $3 billion annually. And second, allow the Post Office to close standalone money-losing Post Offices and replace them with retail facilities in places with high foot traffic. This is not to say that we support all the Postal Service does. We are deeply frustrated with some of the the pricing policies which have allowed it to lose $5 billion over the last four years on underwater products. 
as a prosperous company would not choose to offer products which lose money, and it is completely unacceptable that one, is on the, one that is on the brink of insolvency would continue to do so. Lastly, we do oppose the Post Office, their efforts to go into competition with existing customers. One example of this is the recently passed uh, market test called Mar Marketing Mail Made Easy, easy for that to say. This proposal has generated a lot of opposition from the mail community. We don't think that cannibalizing the mail that is already in the system is the right strategy for growth. I look forward to answering any of your questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stampy. Uh, Mr. Sackler, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> and good afternoon to you, to Ranking Member Lynch and the members of the subcommittee. The Coalition for a 21st Century Postal Service is pleased to present our views on what we also agree is a looming crisis for USPS. The Coalition's 33 trade associations and companies represent a major swath of a nearly $1 trillion industry that employs more than 7.5 million people. It runs the gamut of paper communications, from forestry and paper companies, printers and technology providers, to companies which create every type of mail. There is far more at stake in how the Postal Service fares than the Postal Service itself. The future of an industry roughly 15 times the size of postal revenues, the huge number of jobs it supports, and the substantial impact that industry has on the economy. And we believe postal insolvency, which could happen by the end of this fiscal year without action, will have consequences, not only for the Postal Service, but quite possibly for the Nation. Given the state of the industry and potential postal insolvency, the Coalition believes it imperative for Congress this year to correct a core element of the financial imbalance by eliminating a hidden tax assessed on postal ratepayers that was used to reduce the deficit and effectively subsidize retirements of non-postal Federal retirees, and repatriating that money over time to underwrite the prefunding of retiree health benefits required by Congress. The $50 billion or more in overpayments to CSRS and the nearly $7 billion more to FERS constitute a vast hidden tax that would, if redirected, dramatically improve the position of the service and, consequently, the industry and the public generally which it serves. Some believe repatriating this money would constitute a bailout. With great respect, we strongly disagree. While these overpayments were caused by a good-faith actuarial misinterpretation, they were nonetheless paid, not by the American taxpayer, but by postal ratepayers. As the Postmaster General pointed out, USPS's money comes almost exclusively from user fees, postage, and 90 percent of that comes from businesses. Having collectively funded the bulk of these overpayments, we believe the right outcome is to use the money to benefit the Postal Service and thereby those who depend upon it. The alternative is insolvency. On September 30th, facing the choice of paying $5.5 billion to prefund retirees' health benefits or paying its employees and keeping the lights on, as the Postmaster General uh, put it before, they will sensibly opt for the latter. There will be no legal or other consequences for the Postal Service or its managers, but it will be in default of an obligation. Questions about its reliability will arise for those who do business with it. And will overseas holders of U.S. securities treat this as the first loose thread in unraveling the Nation's financial ball of yarn? What would that do to interest rates and yields for Treasuries? After all, it remains the United States Postal Service. Insolvency must be avoided. And if it isn't, the obligations won't simply go away. To the extent that the financial shortfalls for USPS overtake it, those obligations will fall to Congress, then there will be the need for an actual taxpayer-funded bailout. In our written statement, we offer other recommendations we believe would help the service and the industry grapple with the interrelated financial, structural, and innovative elements of this looming crisis. These include addressing the high costs of compliance with mailing rules, giving the Postal Service more flexibility uh, to close uh, facilities or offer certain non-postal products, more uh, flexibility on negotiated service agreements, and more. Without structural changes as well, financial transfers will only kick the proverbial can down the road, as has been noted several times during this hearing. 
Mail remains an important communications channel. Even in its current fragile state, the postal system remains pervasive and effective. Yet despite these attributes, challenged by disruptive technology and retrenching resulted, resulting from the recession, our system is struggling. Mailers and suppliers have undergone dramatic changes the past two years, collectively enduring hundreds of thousands of layoffs, the shuttering of numerous businesses, and other dislocations. The result has been unprecedented budgetary pressure on mailers to reduce their costs of distribution. No one can force anyone to mail. Mailers have choices. Because of the Internet, first class, the cash cow of the system, is effectively no longer a monopoly and continues to sink like a stone. Each account going online costing a dozen bills, a dozen payments, and several promotional pieces each year. The decline in first class threatens the system's financial stability. Similarly, when prices rise, there is more pressure on catalogers, other advertisers, and periodicals to use alternatives, decrease the weight and size of their mailings, otherwise reduce their mail exposure. Like first class mailers, they have choices via the Internet and other marketing channels. The concomitant effect on suppliers is just as significant. Less mail means less paper, printing, and technology business. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we believe that all of this uh, financial pressure on mailers puts a premium on holding prices down while maintaining service. The Coalition is prepared to work with you and your colleagues to stave off a decline of the Postal Service. It need not be inevitable. I will be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Sackler. Uh, Mr. Rolando, you are recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Ross. Congratulations again on your chairmanship. And good afternoon, Ranking Member Lynch. Welcome back from Afghanistan. And greetings to the other members of the uh, subcommittee. I am pleased to be here today on behalf of the nearly 290,000 members of the National Association of Letter Carriers. We are honored to be the public face of the United States Postal Service, an agency mandated by the U.S. Constitution and one of America's oldest, proudest, and most essential institutions. I have submitted a written statement, but in my few minutes here, I would like to leave you with five points to consider some of which counter the conventional wisdom. It is worth noting that the figures I will cite are from official sources. We can all form our own opinions about public policy, but we should start from shared facts. First, the Postal Service remains a vital part of our society and our economy. It provides the only truly universal delivery and communications network in the United States, serving every corner of this country from the most rural areas of Montana to every city block of Manhattan, six days a week. For several years in a row, the public has named the Postal Service the most trusted Federal agency in America, in large part because of its dedicated and professional workforce. The Postal Service is a vital infrastructure service that is not only an essential element of the country's financial payment system, but also a key facilitator of business and communications for the 150 million homes and businesses it serves. According to a 2009 study by the Postal Service, the annual value of transactions moving through the mail exceeds $30 trillion, underlining its importance to the health of our nation's economy. Second, there is indeed a financial crisis at the Postal Service, one we must address for the sake of the economy and the millions of workers employed by the mailing industry. But it isn't the crisis you might think it is. Let me explain. With the nation still suffering from the worst recession since the Great Depression, mail volume has fallen, a trend exacerbated by Internet diversion. And yet the Postal Service has been running an operational profit. You heard that correctly, postal and profit in the same sentence. In the most recent quarter alone, postal operations had a profit of $226 million taking in more than a quarter billion dollars over operating expenses. That brings to $837 billion the net operational profits over the past four years. And this has been achieved by increased productivity, labor management partnership, fair and flexible work adjustments, and performance and quality that have lifted customer satisfaction, all while maintaining the most affordable postal rates in the world. But while the Postal Service is operating more smartly than ever, it faces a huge burden unrelated to its daily work. 
The 2006 Congressional mandate to prefund future retiree health benefits for the next 75 years and to do so within 10 years, an obligation faced by no public agency or private form in America imperils the Postal Service. In the past four years, the Postal Service has made $20.9 billion in prefunding payments. It is that unique obligation during a recession that has plunged the Postal Service into a financial crisis. Point three, fortunately, there is a good solution. The Postal Service has a surplus of between $50 and $75 billion in its pension funds, according to two independent audits, because of overpayments made since 1971. Congressional approval to let the Postal Service make an internal transfer of its own money derived from the sale of products and services would leave both the pension and retiree funds in far better shape than virtually all such accounts in this country. Why? Because not only have daily postal service operations been carried out efficiently, the agency has been highly responsible with future obligations. All this, let me emphasize, without using any taxpayer money for over a quarter century. We are simply asking that the Postal Service be allowed to use its own money, as any responsible business would. Bipartisan agreement is forming on this crucial reform. Senators Tom Carper and Susan Collins have endorsed the solution and drafted legislation to implement. I am happy to learn that Representative Connolly of this subcommittee has prepared a bill addressing this issue, one that builds on prior work by Ranking Member Lynch. Chairman Ross, we hope you and your colleagues will embrace this bipartisan consensus on prefunding reform. Fourth, while this proposal backed by the Postal Service has no downside, that is not the case with some of the other UPS ideas, USPS ideas. Eliminating Saturday service, for example, would be disastrous. It would save about 5 percent of the postal budget by sacrificing 17 percent of service. It would inconvenience millions of small business owners who transact business on Saturdays and Americans who need medicines on the weekend. It would add 80,000 postal employees to the jobless rolls. It would imperil the Postal Service's future by forcing customers to turn elsewhere. And as competitors fill the vacuum, future revenue would decline. All this to save an amount barely half the annual prefunding payments. No business would choose this option over an internal transfer of its own funds, and neither should we. Finally, the Postal Service has a bright future. The current challenges aren't the first since Benjamin Franklin served as the first Postmaster General, nor will they be the last. As realists, we know we must adapt to society's evolving needs. The mail mix, for example, is shifting with too little first-class mail these days. As the economy improves, we have to watch the mail flow and adapt as needed. Even as we speak, the overall mail volume is rising for the first time in four years. We have lots of ideas on new services to offer the growing number of home-based businesses, on expanding on work with UPS and FedEx as their most economical option for last-mile delivery, or on adding to what letter carriers already do to protect community and national security. I would like to conclude by congratulating all the new members of the subcommittee. We believe these are nonpartisan issues, and the tradition of bipartisan cooperation that has characterized this subcommittee is worth nurturing. We look forward to working with all of you on postal issues and to find bipartisan solutions to the challenge before us. NELC has demonstrated repeatedly in recent years that it is prepared to do its part to help preserve the long term viability of the Postal Service by serving the American people and helping the businesses that rely on universal service to grow and prosper. And we remain every bit as committed to that goal today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rolanda. We have been called for uh, votes. We have got about 11 and a half minutes to go. Uh, Mr. Lynch and I have agreed that we are going to try to do five minutes each, and then we will recess and come back uh, right afterwards if, uh, and, and, and finish then. So if those need to go, go ahead and go. I will start with a series of questions. Um, uh, Mr. Rolando. Um, one of the things that um, was pointed out in the GAO report, and Mr. Herr, that uh, was here in the first panel, indicated that uh, as now, as UP, USPS now has costly excess capacity, uh, is that something that you can comment on? And, and, and if, are you aware of excess capacity, whether it be in distribution or uh, wherever? I don't know what he was referring to. No. Okay. Um, with regard to also another recommendation that GAO had in, in terms of. Uh, collective bargaining and binding arbitration. Uh, his recommendation was that 
the financial condition of the United States Postal Service should be taken into consideration in, in, in the binding arbitration procedures. How do you feel about that? His wish is granted because uh, the financial condition of the Postal Service has been considered uh, in every arbitration that we have had. The uh, arbitrators are required to consider the arguments of both parties. And in every interest arbitration we have had, uh, that issue has come up and been considered by, by the arbitrators. I, I appreciate that, that, that perspective. Uh, to all three of you, um, you, you, rec you all recognize, I think, that the recession has had an impact on, on mail. I mean, there was, a, there, there was an increase in volume from 1990 to 2007, but we have seen a decrease. Do you think that the, and I will start with you, Mr. Rolando, do you think that the United States Postal Service has done enough aggressively to cut costs? And if not, what would you recommend that they, that they further do? I think they should continue what they are doing to work with the unions on win-win solutions. I know my union has uh, worked with them uh, uh, aggressively for the last few years on adjusting routes to the change in volumes, uh, which by their own numbers has saved them over a billion dollars. And I think we need to continue uh, to work together through negotiations and in between those negotiations on these win-win solutions. Mr. Sackler? Well, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, the uh, Postal Service and its employees have indeed cut a lot of uh, costs out of the system. But by definition, looking at the situation that it is in, it hasn't been enough. Uh, we think that there, to get to your previous question, our understanding is that the system is overbuilt by almost a factor of two, and that there needs to be a drastic realignment and restructuring, closing and consolidation of facilities. And for that, uh, there will need to be some change in the law, and there will have to be support from Congress because. So you agree that there is excess capacity? Yes. Okay. We do. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Sampley, with regard to costs. Yeah, I would say that they've they've done a great job uh, the, between the unions and, and the the administration and the, in the post office. They've done a fantastic job to manage the costs, and and I think there's more that they can do if if some legislative activities are taken to to give them a little more room uh, to work on the cost side of the house. And we're very supportive of the Postal Regulatory Commission on the especially on the pricing side to to guide some give some oversight. But I think the, uh, the management and the union have uh, a lot of opportunities to take additional dollars out of the business if, if we give them a little, over, little bit of latitude with legislative activities. Uh, Mr. Sackler, back to you. Um, you touched on this in your opening remarks about uh, if the Postal Service defaulted on its obligation to the Treasury. Uh, can you expound on what impact you think that would have? I mean, assuming we did nothing and they couldn't meet their obligation, they have exceeded their $15 billion borrowing limit or met it at least, what is what's, what's the, outcome? What's the outcome? As we understand it, there are no legal, operational or practical consequences for USPS or its managers. But the implications in terms of how people look at the service and, and the fact that whether or not it is functioning largely independently, it is still an arm of the United States Government. And to have an arm of the United States Government default on an obligation, even if the actual impact is only technical, you have to think, well, what are those who are holding our bonds and have the future of our finances in their hands thinking? It is so all it a psychological credit, game. Uh, it, could, it could affect our credit rating. Exactly. Okay. Uh, last, lastly, Mr. Sampi, you, you want to comment on that? Just one comment on that. I think um, Pat brought it up in his statement. I think that the, the industry confidence in the, in the post office and some of the challenges that they are having right now, you know, there are a lot of folks out in the industry that are saying, should we move to digital, should we move to something else, uh, for fear of where the post office is going to end up. I think whatever we do, we need to do it quickly. I think we need to move on this as a, a cohesive group and, and work together and figure out how do we get the confidence back. The, the post office has done a great job and they are, the quality of service has been fantastic. Uh, thank you. Mr. Lynch, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to make a couple of clarifications. I know that uh, my dear friend from Florida, uh, Mr. Mack, uh, commented that, uh, you know, government doesn't have uh, the ability to, to uh, help business uh, make the necessary reforms. I just want to remind uh, the gentleman that uh, the United States Postal Service is, is, a, is a unique business. It was actually created uh, by the United States Congress. Uh, and uh, it is one of the few institutions that is explicitly provided for in the United States Constitution. And, and uh, government has done a pretty good job over the past 236 years in, uh, in guiding the Post Office uh, in providing universal service uh, uh, 
six days a week and has done a pretty good job, as some of the, uh, the polling out there has indicated, that uh, our postal employees are, most, are the most trusted uh, public employees in the United States today. Uh, I would also like to point out, with respect to the suggestion that, uh, that OPM is correct in their, their assertion that the, the overpayment does not exist, I, I just want to, for the benefit of the new members especially, I just want to sort of lay out the history here of OPM denying obligations and, uh, and what the results have been. Going back to 2002, the Postal Service Pension Fund was found to be overfunded by OPM by $78 billion, and we in Congress had to go back in 2003 and tell OPM, you have got to straighten this out. So there was an overpayment there of $78 billion. Then in 2003, OPM attempted to make the Postal Service pick up the responsibilities for, uh, for military service pensions, uh, obligations for Postal Service employees. So if they were in the service, they wanted the Post Office to pick up their pension credits that were due because of their military service. And we said that that would not be, be right. Uh, so Congress rejected that attempt. Uh, in 2009, we, we found that OPM used an exaggerated 7 percent health care appreciation uh, in, inflation forecast instead of the 5 percent that is the industry standard. And that resulted in an overpayment of $13.2 billion uh, by 2016. So we had to go back and we audited OPM cut that out, you know, use the st industry standard, and so OPM then went back and changed it. And now the Postal Service has been overcharged by $75 billion for its share of CSRS pensions for folks, for, for their pension credits before they came, before they became USPS employees. <coughs> People have to understand that. These are pension credits for folks before they went to work for the Post Office, so, but they they have been overcharged and the Post Office is picking up the inflation for those costs. So there is a whole history here of the OPM. And, and look, anybody can make a mistake, but in, in every single case, OPM overcharged the Post Office by tens of billions of dollars. So that is the record we have here. Th those are the facts. And, uh, y you know, there, there does seem to be a uh, oh, and by the way, uh, the OPM uh, wrote a rather gratuitous letter that they, they thought, by God, the post office should have to prefund their, their, uh, uh, their health care obligations 100 percent, prefunded by 100 percent. But if you look at what OPM is doing, they prefund their obligations at 40 percent. So you would think what is good for the goose is good for the gander, but that is not the case. So I just wanted to make those clarifications just for some of the, the newer members that are on board here. Uh, Mr. Orlando, in my re remaining time before I run up the hill, I want to ask, uh, with respect to uh, going from six-day delivery to five-day delivery, that affects your, your membership, the letter carriers and, and, and the mail handlers uh, dramatically. Is there any information that you would like Congress to have before, or you think the Post Office should provide to Congress before we make that decision? Well, I think it is important that it not only affects my members, it affects uh, thousands and thousands of billions, uh, thousands and thousands of businesses across America who have contacted the NALC directly, uh, responded to the NALC uh, in, in terms of their objections to five day delivery and, and how it would affect them. And we right. I don't mean to interrupt you, but in fairness, I have to tell you, I heard loud and clear from the folks that uh, have catalogs and magazines that apparently they use uh, Saturday as their delivery day because they want folks to actually, on their day off, actually read the product that they deliver. So you are right. It is not solely in, in your interest. But go ahead. Yeah, that, that, that was what I wanted okay. to say, how the effect on the businesses, not to mention the, the public. Okay. And the customers. Good. All right. Thank you. We are going to recess uh, to go take our votes, and we will return after, the first, after this first vote. Okay? And then we should be able to, to, to finish, finish up. Thank you for your patience. We will be back. <coughs>